All right, welcome. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Windows containers and uh, host process containers for configuration and beyond. Um, and so before we get too deep into the details of how uh, Windows containers, host process containers work, um, we're going to show you a quick demo, uh, get right into it and show you how this works. Uh, who here has used Windows uh, containers before? All right, and who has had to debug and get onto the node, like SSH or RDP onto the node? All right, so only one or two folks, but you know how painful that is. Uh, and so for everybody else, uh, SSH, SSHing into the node usually requires doing a proxy jump or RD, like setting up a, a VM inside the network so you can RDP. Then you need to know the, the password to that VM, and it's difficult, challenging. Um, and so what I'm going to show you here today is uh, we're going to use a kubectl plugin to connect to the node and get direct access to the node. No SSH, no, um, no passwords, and none of that. And so we're going to get just easy access. Uh, and so in the demo, the things to look for are how fast this container boots up and, um, and the tools that we get to use, such as Vim and other things. So I'm going to start the demo here. First thing we're going to do is take a quick look at the, the nodes. So you're going to see a Linux node and a Windows node. Uh, and then we're going to install the plugin. So we're going to use crew to do that. Uh, crew install Windows debug. Uh, crew, if you are not familiar with crew, it installs a plugin so you can start to use that tool directly with kubectl. Next, I'm going to run uh, kubectl Windows debug. And it's so fast that I can barely say it. We just got connected to the Windows node. And we have access to the, the root file system there. And we can run programs on the, the application. Uh, we can see all the logs. Uh, and there was no SSH or RDP. I've also got access to Vim, uh, which is typically not something you install on the, on the machines. But now I can edit the config files, kind of poke around, do some searching with inside the um, error logs or anything else there. And so. Uh, this is all hosted inside this HPC folder here. And inside there, you're going to see we have um, Vim, but we also have some networking scripts that we ship out of the box so that you can collect traces and uh, packets and all sorts of other things there. Uh, and the best part about that is it all goes away when the, um, when the, the container gets killed. So that's a quick demo. Hopefully, that gets you excited. Uh, I'm James Sturvant. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. Uh, I've been working with Windows containers for four or five years now. Uh, I'm a tech lead for Sig Windows and a uh, maintainer uh, at Cluster API for Azure, uh, mostly doing Windows uh, work there. Uh, and I know how to make fire six different ways using only sticks and stones, and that's related to my Twitter handle, Aspen Wilder, so you can ask me about that later. Mark? Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Mark Rossetti. I am also a software engineer at Microsoft. I am the co-chair of SIG Windows, and I kind of pop in all around different parts of core Kubernetes to make sure things work with Windows. Um, I am not generally on Twitter. OK, uh, so here's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, we're going to do an overview of what host process containers are. That was the new kind of feature that powered everything in that demo. Then we're going to go deep into one or two deployments to show you guys kind of how it works. And then we're going to probably fill up most of the rest of the time with some demos and then uh, have some additional resources and questions and answers. So first off, what are host process containers? Host process containers are conceptually equivalent to privileged containers on Linux for anybody who's familiar with that. Um, it really just is a way where you can package, distribute, and deploy your workloads as containers to Windows nodes. Uh, these containers run as a process directly on the host, hence the name host process containers, um, which gives you, you know, almost full access to the host's file system, you know, network stack, process space, event viewers, all of that. I say almost because we'll demo some security considerations for all of these in the future. Um, the other great thing about this is we really designed this feature to be you know, Kubernetes first. Um, so they're deployed as containers, but they run just as a normal pod, so you get the benefits of all of the different uh, constructs 
that you're used to, like volume mounts, you know, resource limits, everything that's managed there, or listed there. So, uh, what are some of the motivations for this? Really, I think as James hit uh, earlier, managing and provisioning Windows was extremely difficult. Um, also, there really wasn't a good uh, standardized way to deploy many of the essential components that needed to run on the node. Uh, your CNI solutions, kube proxy, um, before all of that, uh, really, it was just up to the, whoever was setting up the node to set that up. It often involved a lot of custom PowerShell to parse environment, um, relied on third-party you know, service managers, often MS NSSM was the big one. Um, there really was a poor upgrade story. You needed to orchestrate logging into the node and rolling your own updates each time. Um, and it also, yeah, just another downside was requiring access to the node. Um, and then your workloads, once they were running uh, with this, they were very difficult to monitor. You really didn't have any visibility into if they were running or not, the error state. Um, again, you required access to the nodes to even get that information, and you had no easy way to get your logs. Now, with those process containers, um, you can deploy all of these workloads just as daemon sets. So it's a you know, familiar upgrade story, familiar deployment story, runs as a container, which everybody <laughs> uh, here is used to. You have uh, rolling updates, all, all of that, and actually no access to the node is required, as I already demoed. Um, and then once your workloads are deployed, you monitor them just like anything else. Uh, you could do, just check to see if your pods are running, they'll get restarted. If they, they're not, you can use logs to, to monitor them, all, all of that. Um, here's a little bit of information about the history of this feature. Um, this feature went beta in Kubernetes 123. That's when it's generally on by default, so it called that out here. And it is going stable in this re next release of Kubernetes. One thing to note, though, is this functionality is only supported if you're running container D as your container runtime. Um, I believe most Windows users have migrated to that now, so not a big issue. Uh, so here, we're gonna go into some deployments, James. Cool, so um, now that you know kind of what host process containers are, we wanted to show you how you'd actually use them. Uh, and so we're gonna take a look at a big spec here, and don't worry, I'm gonna zoom in here. <laughs> uh, and the first thing we're gonna take a look at is the, the pod spec and using the um, security context. So this is the standard Windows security context that we're hooking into here. You can see that we'd say host process true, uh, and then we specify who we want to run as. Uh, and this is powerful because we can use um, security policies to block uh, people deploying these because it's built into the pod spec. Uh, we also s specify host network equals true. We need to work, uh, for the CNI specifically, we need to work within the host network compartment to be able to program all the, the rules for the networking in there. Uh, and so. Uh, we have access to that there as well. And Mark's working on a KEP to enable that for regular containers as well. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can talk to him afterwards. The next part uh, I wanna dive in on, on is the init containers. Uh, so Mark said we, we, we built this with Kubernetes, uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, ideas in, in mind, and so we can use init containers with these host process containers. and. Uh, this enables us to be able to install things like CNI binaries. This is a very f familiar pattern from the Linux side. And so I no longer need to go download these things and prep them on my Windows node initially. I can uh, apply them at the, the time I'm applying my CNI. It enables things for upgrades and other things like that. And I can also pass in the configuration at this time. So I no longer need to know that I'm gonna be running overlay or SDN bridge or any of those things, I can swap out the configuration using a config map at that time. Next up, we have multiple containers here. Uh, Calico needs a little bit of uh, prep before Felix runs to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API. Uh, and so we're able to run more than one container inside this pod with that host process, and then they communicate to each other via the file system in this case, uh, but there's other ways they could do that. Uh, and the most exciting part here is that they have full access to the API server using the uh, security, um, uh, sorry, the uh, service account that's applied to the pod. Uh, and so you can specify that they're able to access different components of the API 
and uh, communicate with them without having to copy around cube configs and do other things, which is the way that we did that uh, on, the, on the host node pri prior to this. Next up is we're using volume mounts. And so I kind of alluded to this before, but I can map in exactly where I want to copy those CNI binaries. Uh, and then I can also uh, use the config map to configure the, the CNI in the way that I want to. So uh, the next part that I wanted to call out here is uh, Kube proxy. So we're also uh, enabled this for Kube proxy, uh, and we're using it basically in the same way. You'll see the host process uh, security context at the top there. Uh, but we also are using the um, downward API to pass in information. And because this is built into Kubernetes, we no longer have to use our PowerShell scripts and do some kind of fancy thing to go figure out exactly what the pod IP address is. We get that information just given to us through the, the Kubernetes native uh, const constructs. And uh, on top of that, we can use taints and tolerations with these. Uh, so we can say, we only, this is a critical component because it's the kube proxy. We need this running at all times. Uh, and then upgrading becomes super simple. We're using Kubernetes upgrade strategies here instead of having to build our own through some sort of PowerShell scripts or something along those lines. And so uh, for those that may have noticed at the top when we were talking about who this container runs as, uh, Mark is going to talk a little bit about how we can restrict the access uh, of that container user. Yeah, so you'll, and you'll notice in the previous demos, we were running as a local system account. That's generally not desirable in a lot of cases. Um, so we do have some mechanisms so that uh, people can configure uh, what access these containers have on each one of the nodes. There's a demo here that I'll kind of narrate as it's going through. So this deployment has a PowerShell script. What was that? Um, yes, yeah, essentially. So he asked if that would be a equivalent of a, like a running, run as as a service account. And yes, yes it is. Um, so here you'll see here there's a PowerShell script that gets plopped in as a config map uh, that runs on the nodes. The first thing we do is we use a uh, net local user to create a local user account. And then we create some folders um, and give different access to those. Um, here you'll see, well, we just missed, there's an init container that all it does is it run that, runs that script. And then there's two workload containers in here, one that runs as that NT authority system, and one that runs where we set the run as username to that new local group name. Uh, and that's what's highlighted here. So this local group did not exist on the machine before this deployment started. Um, so here we'll start this deployment, and then we'll wait for the containers to run. And then we'll poke around inside the containers. So this is the, what I call the admin container. Um, here you can see we're running as NT Authority System. And we'll just see if we have access to these different chairs. In this case, we have access to both of them. And here's the other chair. Now we'll exec into the other container that was running as that local user group. Um, I'll talk more about the, the output of this who am I in a minute. Um, but here you'll see that we, I think we try and access that admin share, and get an access denied, and then we try and access that other share. And we have access to that share. So um, I'll talk about what's going on here. Um, usually, so now, well, I mean, we realized that this is a pretty powerful feature and we want to limit access to the node, um, but we're trying to figure out a way to do that that didn't require having people manage uh, you know, user accounts on the nodes, either using weak passwords or potentially no passwords or other things. So uh, what, what happens here is if you pass in the, a local group name as that run as user name, uh, when these containers are started, we'll actually create a new user, a local user, uh, add it to that group, so we'll, we'll inherit all of the security permissions from that group. And then your container will run as that user, and then that user will get cleaned up at the end. Um, this is 
beneficial because, yeah, it makes it a lot easier to manage uh, these user accounts. You don't need these passwords. And there's just a lot of benefits to this. Um, another nice thing with this is it uh, really completely falls into the Windows security model. So you assign access or deny access to all of the different Windows resources uh, just with native Windows constructs, like these local security groups here. Um, and as James mentioned here, uh, we're relying on people using different policy engines to restrict who can, like, who these containers can run as and what namespaces and all of that. I need to check. Um, I don't. Well, let, let's. Uh, I'll bring some other people up to help answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing that I wanted to call out here is um, you may have noticed that these containers start pretty fast for Windows containers. Um, as we were developing this feature, we noticed, like, since it is a process just running directly on the host, you really don't need all of the stuff that comes in with these uh, the Windows container base images. So we uh, tried to make it so that you didn't need this, and uh, so we created a new base image here. This new base image can only be used with host process containers, but it is very small. It's about 25 kilobytes, which if people are used to working with Windows, other Windows containers, uh, nano servers on the order of 100 megabytes. Um, one other benefit with this is the same image will work across all versions of Windows Server. So you can build a single container image and deploy it to your Windows Server 2019 nodes, your Windows 20, or Server 20, 2022 nodes, and that too. Um, one thing I will note is you must use BuildKit to build this image. Um, but there's a demo here. And for anybody who's interested, there's a GitHub repository that has the source code that's used to build the image and instructions on how to, uh, how to use this too. And uh, if anybody is not familiar with using BuildKit to build images, um, it's pretty easy. So here's a quick demo. Um, first, we'll have a hello world file that just says hello world, um, and a Docker file, and then so with buildx, you need to make a buildx builder and specify the target uh, operating system or the platform to use. But then you can just use the docker buildx build commands to build that. So in this case, building it, pushing it to a registry. And then here I've got a pod spec that's using that. And then we'll run it. And I, this image was not uh, pre-pulled on this machine here too. So super fast. James? Great, so now that we have an understanding of what host process containers are and how to configure them and operate with them, uh, we wanted to show off a few um, tools that the community has already built with host process containers. Uh, the first one we're gonna show is a tool that I developed that I solved the problem that I needed inside SIG Windows. Um, and so I, I'm one of the ones that maintain all the SIG Windows tests, and we have occasional flakes that happen every 40th or 50th run. Uh, and we needed Windows traces, uh, ETL traces, to be able to collect and debug these things uh, because we identified that the bug was in the OS. Uh, running a trace, these end-to-end -end tests take about an hour to, or so to run, and running a trace for that long would result in a many gigabyte uh, size file, a massive. Uh, and so I needed a way to be able to uh, trigger when, that when a specific test was running and then kick off the uh, traces and then get them uploaded somewhere. So what I'm gonna show you here is uh, the tool that I built to do this. Uh, I've called it the trigger logger, uh, <laughs> which not very creative here. Um, and so first thing we'll do is uh, we're gonna uh, install the trigger logger. So it's just a YAML file. It is a host process container that's running in the background. Uh, and it, um, it has a config map. And that config map uh, allows you to, to, to configure this, this tool. And the thing that we're, we're gonna look at is uh, it has a trigger that runs on namespace creation. I know what that namespace is that's gonna be created in the test, and so every time that test kicks off, I'm gonna run that. Next up, once that trigger triggers, I'm going to run WPR, or Windows Performance Recorder. The Windows Performance Recorder is a thing that creates that ETL file. Uh, and then, finally, 
uh, at the end, once, once I destroy the namespace, I'm gonna upload that to, to Azure storage or any kind of blob storage that's available to me. So I've got this tool running. Uh, you'll see that it is using the in-cluster config that I mentioned before. So it's communicating to the API server uh, and it's using the, the service account that I've wired that has access to list namespaces. Uh, it's listening to all the namespaces inside the cluster. Uh, and then the next step for me is going to, uh, we're gonna listen to the logs of um, the trigger logger and create that namespace. So on the left-hand side here, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna tail the logs. You'll see the same logs we just saw. And then now I'm gonna create the namespace that it's listening for. Uh, in this case, I called it WPR CPU. It could be anything you want. Um, and on the left, we'll see that immediately Windows Performance Recorder started running. And this is something that's built into all of uh, the Windows operating systems. And uh, I'm collecting CPU, disk, file information. Uh, and then I'm gonna delete that namespace. And once it's deleted, we'll see uh, we, we pro we're processing that event. And then we write the ETL file out. Uh, so once this ETL file processes, we then uh, run off and start uploading it to Azure. And I forgot to cut this out, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh. That won't let me uh, skip ahead. Sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, that's too bad. So uh, I, I, will, I, I will upload this to YouTube later, but uh, what happens next is it gets uploaded to Azure, and once it's on Azure, I'm able to pull that ETL file down, use Windows Performance Analyzer, and I can see the individual stack traces, how much CPU, how much memory is used on the node, um, and I'm able to identify exactly where we're having a performance problem or something else. And I've used this specifically to improve Kubelet uh, from going from using about 3% steady CPU down to 1.5. And so a super powerful way to, in, in, to uh, analyze and debug these things uh, and uh, fire them off on on demand. So the next one, and I'm, this one I won't skip through, <laughs> uh, is a networking demo. Uh, and so this one was built by uh, our networking team, and um, they need to be able to identify uh, packets being dropped or manipulated throughout the, the, the VM. Uh, and so what, what they've developed is this component called uh, Win Container Network Inspector, and it's a daemon set that runs on the nodes and does some controlling uh, of the various processes that are related to networking. And once that's installed, I can connect to it using a command line tool uh, called Win Inspector. Uh, and once I'm connected there, the this tool will let me uh, query various networking commands. Uh, and so I can see, I can do cap network uh, packet captures, I can do counters, I can query the HNS logs, which is where the networking uh, configuration that's set up. And so here, I've run that networking configuration, and I can see all the networks that are created on the law, on a node, I can see all the load balancers that have been created, uh, and I can see all the mappings between those. So if something got misconfigured somewhere, uh, it's very easy to inspect that. Uh, and this is super powerful in a large cluster if you have 100 different nodes and you, you're saying, hey, this node here is acting weird and I'm gonna go inspect it. So the next step that um, I kicked off here is a packet tra trace. So I've got an IIS application running on that node um, and with Kubernetes, uh, obviously, most of the packet traces that I'm interested in are probably about a specific um, container. And so 
uh, when I, um, so I can say, uh, I'm gonna capture the packets for this particular pod within my entire cluster. Uh, again, very powerful because I no longer need to capture all of the networking traffic across all of the stack happening on a, on a particular node, which could be very noisy. Uh, and so here, I'm gonna send the curl request, and then on the right-hand side, you should see a bunch of traffic coming in. Um, if you know what you're looking here, this is just telling you the packets going through the, the various components of the networking stack. Uh, this can be converted to uh, a Wireshark, and so you can load this into Wireshark and then analyze it from there. Uh, and we're using Packetmon behind the scenes, which is another tool that ships with Windows Server and the latest releases. Uh, and so I can filter down to individual packets, I can filter down into individual components within the networking stack and, and just see those components. And the last thing I'm gonna show here is um, sometimes you don't know what's going on and you know that maybe the packets are dropping uh, but you're not sure how bad it is. And so I can just quickly query against a, a node and it will give me the counters that uh, are, are being seen on that node. And so then it, from there, I can narrow it down to something else that's happening. Yeah, so the networking team actually used this to identify some various bugs uh, within uh, uh, some, some customers that we, we had experienced. Um, and uh, this enabled them to identify a, an individual pod running in a, a 100 node cluster and say, this is the component that um, is, is causing problems. So super powerful tools. Uh, these are all open source, and the next part um, we're gonna step into is just some additional resources. Um, so since we have released host process containers for, um, for Kubernetes in 123, we've had a huge adoption of this across the ecosystem, as you can see from all these projects. So that when uh, Windows Container Inspect is in there, um, QProxy's in there, uh, Calico, uh, and I think one of the other really good ones is Windows Exporter for Prometheus. Um, so there's a ton out there. There's even more that we didn't get to list here. Um, and the thing I wanna call out, if you are new to the Kubernetes ecosystem and you wanna contribute, this is a great way to contribute to Windows. There's a lot of examples out there that you can leverage, and there's a lot of projects that either don't know this is available or um, don't have the Windows expertise to be able to do this. And so you can go out there and make a pretty significant contribution uh, that enables the ecosystem. Oh uh, yeah, so this, this feature and all of the like, de things that we've demoed here were really developed in conjunction with SigWindows, so we wanted to take a minute to highlight some other upcoming talks related to SigWindows. Um, there's a Windows Operational Readiness talk tomorrow. There's a SigWindows Maintainer Track talk tomorrow, and then there's a interesting uh, Lessons Learned from Scheduling 20 Million Windows Containers in a Month talk on Friday. So if you're interested, uh, please come support us. And um, before we get to the q and I just wanted to put up some resource slides here. Um, don't worry about taking this down, just download the slides off sketch. Um, but there's a lot more information about the CAP, the discussions that went into uh, eventually bringing this feature to fruition, um, documentation on how to use it, lots of examples, um, all of that. Um, if anybody is interested in participating or getting more information here, uh, we encourage you to just go through the normal SIG Windows communication channels, uh, big, the biggest one being the SIG Windows uh, Slack channel, um, but there's also, we have a community guide on how to reach us, and we have a community meeting every Tuesday at 12.30 uh, PST. So hope to see more people there. Uh, next, we'll open it up to Q&A, and at the same time, I'll just leave this up if anybody wants to leave some feedback. Hey, uh, one of the differences between a uh, privileged container in Linux and a host process container is that the container is running as a process in the host, right? So um, I also know that there is no file system isolation. So for cluster administrators that want to enable this feature, what uh, security recommendations do you have so that workloads cannot access 
uh, kind of have the same access on the file system. I had a little bit of a hard time hearing it because the speakers are facing all of you, but I heard um, what kind of security considerations should administrators take uh, when using these, is that correct? Correct. Particularly around the file system. Um, so since so, many, so much of this is controlled just through the normal Kubernetes constructs, um, really the, the built-in security, security admission policies will help cover you a lot. I know if you're in the restricted policy, um, you won't be able to schedule host process containers um, and all of that. So we really recommend um, all the best practices about really not allowing host, host path volume mounts and that sort of the thing. And I think that should help get you kind of started, but the rest is really just knowing what workloads you're deploying, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I would say the, the part where Mark showed um, how to set up those user groups uh, and restrict access to the file system from there, uh, you, could, you could create a user, group, uh, a user um, membership that didn't have access to most of the file system and, and then kind of opt in from there. So that, that would probably be the, the best approach. All right, thank you. In line of that question, are there any features you can share about what you might do if you were to ever consider proper isolation on that level? I mean, it's hard because you're giving root access away effectively. Is there a future roadmap that you can share on that? or? So I thought I heard is, uh, is there a future for more isolated access to the host? Um, currently, no. We're hoping that, um, I, we just haven't had it planned, but if there's some interesting use cases, um, we'd, we'd like to hear it. Most of the use cases that we've highlighted required either pretty broad access to the host or were allowing us to, um, yeah, we could just restrict it with what we demoed. But uh, yeah, if you have some use cases, feel free to bring it to us. So the, the container's root of the file system is the, the node's root, right? So C drive is C drive. Is that correct? Um, so there is some virtualization happening there. Uh -huh. um, yes, so your, your container image will get mounted to a well-known location, C colon HPC, and then it will be there. Okay. Um, all of the C drive will get mapped in um, to that as well, and right. then your volume mounts will show up just like they do in normal Windows Server containers. So uh, if you mount in like var log, it'll show up in C colon var log. Right, but if, if in your example where you're using the init container to install something, if I delete that pod, it's still installed, right? You installed it physically on the node, and all I did was delete whatever the deployment of the, the, the container image was from the disk and close the pro stop the process, I guess. Correct, yeah, all of okay. those side effects are going to carry forward once that pod stops. Right. So just specifically, like in the CNI case there, we copied the CNI binaries into the CNI location. Yeah. Um, but like the Vim, we, like we, we had a Vim, that doesn't live on the host. That was in the container, and when the container went away, it was, it's gonna be removed as well. Okay. So it depends on where you put the binaries on the, the system. Right, but if I go running MSIs or something like that, I'm installing on the node. Uh, yeah, most likely. <laughs> and that was one of the kind of use cases we had envisioned for that too, is like, what if you want to apply your security patches in a staged right. update, so, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, one more, <laughs> right. Probably the last one and then we can continue afterwards if needed. Makes me run here. Uh, for that particular scenario, uh, is there going to be some sort of shadowing of what's mounted in the container? So if my container defines a directory that is in the host, is it going to be, which one is going to be taken? So um, there's... There, there's a cap, and actually the, the PRs to do this have a lot of discussion around that too, so I'll, I'll probably defer to that, but the short answer is uh, no. We actually, so if, if for whatever reason that SQL and HPC folder exists on the node, um, we clear it so that you won't get that, the contention, the same contention that you can get with shadowing. Um, but other than that, um, 
it's uh, there's not really much concern there. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last last one for real. Hi, fabulous talk. Um, question for you. I know that there are a lot of really exciting caps in flight um, around Windows stuff as well. If somebody wants to jump in and start participating in some of the actual, like the caps and other things like this that you're in the process of working on, yeah, this one is going GA. That's great. But what other ones are kind of a, an exciting place people might get involved? Oh, that's what our maintainer talk is covering tomorrow, too. So if you're interested in that, too. But um, as James mentioned, uh, host networks, like access to the host network compartment for regular Windows Server containers is one. And really following a whole bunch of the node, the SIG node caps to bring parity to Windows is that, too. Yep. What the one uh, that we're working on right now is the Cry API for uh, stats, uh, which um, is a, a big uh, change in the way that stats are listed from the node in uh, Kubelet. So. That's another big one that you could get involved in. Okay. All right. Also, I'll mention, I think James and I are heading over to the Azure booth if people are interested. And then there is the booth crawl um, at 6. So yeah, and we, were, we were just asking, what time is that talk tomorrow that you're mentioning? 5.25 PM. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe, for coming. <laughs>